Welcome to the PRJ Podcast, an audio program of the Performance Response Journal Platform. I'm your host, Felicia Holman. The PRJ Podcast is inspired by all the artistic risk-taking, meaning-making, and community-building happening in Chicago in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. I'll be talking one-on-one with a featured member of Chicago's expansive and experimental performing arts community, offering illuminating insight into the agility, passion, and resilience fueling Chicago's independent performing artists and cultural producers. The PRJ Podcast offers a space to affirm and bolster the vitality of our shared artistic home, Sweet Home Chicago. Thanks for listening. My guest today is Anjal Chande. Hello and welcome to the PRJ Podcast, Anjal. Yay, it's great to be here, Felicia. What an honor. Oh, thank you. The pleasure's mine. So this has been quite the year, (laughs) and it has been quite the learning curve of of a year as well. Um, For those of us who are seasoned in our practices, can you talk a bit about how self-care and your very well established artistic practice, how it has changed during this pandemic moment. And, you know, just how are you? How is self-care in your practice working for you in this moment? Yeah, what a relevant question. Uh, I I feel like uh, walks have been my thing, um, have been, I feel like there have been two things that have have been different I think about this last year is is you know one the one thing is like learning to go on a walk every day as just regular lifestyle practice um Mm -hmm. not to to get anywhere but to just wander and I think uh it's really I've I've had I just have really appreciated walking along the residential streets of Chicago and appreciating the residential architecture of all of these homes. And of course, many have changed and are changing mm-hmm. and there's the new and there's the old. But I think that pra- like the practice of looking and um, being present on, on all, in all of these like in-between spaces of the city, mm-hmm. um, these quieter corners, uh, I think have has been one of those one of those rituals that has kind of filled me and fueled me um, and grounded me I think when everything else you know when there's like very little else that you can control um yeah and you know it's one of like it's one of those simple ways that our bodies move um Mm -hmm. walking and I, I think that's been really it's been a good practice to to instill that I think is probably gonna outlive my pandemic era um I would say that the other rant, like very random thing that has somehow given me some solace has been uh, making cakes. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and it's, and, and, and I bring it up because it's like, it's been really hard, I think, um, to get the satisfaction, right, of, of creating and fulfilling a vision in this moment. Um, mm mm-hmm. And I, I, I'm not even a cake person, but I like it. So it's very random for myself, but like, but I think there's been something about, um, the sort of like the arc of like creating something from scratch Mm -hmm. and seeing it realized, uh, you know, not within days and weeks and months that like some of our other creative projects sometimes take, but, Mm -hmm. but in the span of like maybe a few hours or within a day, you can have this like thing that you've made that has like that has a bit of a ta-da about it yeah um and I think that it's been one of it's one of it's been one of those random outlets for me to find that kind of um, that kind of satisfaction in a moment where like you can't you can't really experience it much else you know yeah I really resonate that that testimony really resonates with me I 
recently had a conversation with another artist um, talking about the, you know, the loss of that visceral aspect of our practice as performance based artists, Mm -hmm. um, as movement artists. And so that cake baking practice that you've taken up and how that relates to that, that very that very element of that visceral, like you're saying, the missing of the being in a space with other people and having that biofeedback loop right then and there when you're in studio or on stage in a performance. But when you have this cake that you've put all of these ingredients in and then after about an hour in the oven or so, like you have this thing and Mm -hmm. you can share it with people or you can enjoy it yourself, but it's, it's, you know, visceral, it's tangible, it's part of you. So Mm -hmm. I really, I really resonate with that. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd say that like, I mean, the pandemic, gosh, it's such a weird time to reflect on it because we're so, so deep into it. And then it's it's very disorienting. But I mean, gosh, to reflect on the pandemic and like, obviously, it's been a moment of in- intense loss and intense, like, kind of attempt and att- like attempt after attempt to sort of be like, okay, I think this is what the moment is. Let me try to reconfigure my life and make and like make sense and like Mm -hmm. make sense of the moment and and do something in this moment. Um, But then, you know, every time you attempt the sort of situation sort of changes or or your efforts are squashed or squandered or like, you know, it's not really the kind of condition in which you can. uh, Yeah, like move the needle sometimes. Yeah. And I think that that's why this the sort of simple creative act of like oh i can like make i can i can make and build through yeah. <laughs> through baking uh yeah i mean it might seem like a, a common response these days but i think that the cakes have have given me that satisfaction that's been hard to come by yeah i like that it it also brings to mind another aspect of this same conversation about how things have pivoted or or changed for you during the dy- dynamic pandemic era we're living through. But thinking about uh, the time element, not just that visceral aspect, but how much time and like literally the pace, the slower pace. Can you talk about how this this slower pace of creation or of even generating creative energies. Can you talk about how the slower pace of the pandemic influences your work now? Yeah. Oof. I mean, I, so I, before the pandemic hit, I was already in the middle of what was a years long project, um, Mm -hmm. creatively speaking, artistically speaking. And that by itself was already really unusual for me. I think to sort mm-hmm. of be like, here's a project and not it's not going to be done in a sweet little calendar year that matches the administrative, like it's the institutional calendar, but I'm actually mm-hmm. going to be working on a project that takes years. And I think for me, that was like, and that was and, and honestly still is uh, an adjustment for my brain. Um, but I think when, but I was, I was actually hoping to reach that sort of culminating moment um, in 2020. And I think the pandemic... Ooh, I mean, it, it, you know, just the immediate sort of like, and this is going to take longer um, mm-hmm. and this is going to go slower and this is going to, yeah, move along a different timeline. I think, you know, in, in a weird way, it was a sort of like secret, like, yes, I get to like, like I get to keep gestating. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't want to say yes, maybe not, not, maybe not with that kind of enthusiasm. I mean, I think it was like, <laughs> it was a a total mixed bag of like, oh no, I don't think I can hold this in any longer. And then also like, oh, it is an okay, like reminder to continue to give ourselves the permission to take time. And I think that like, I think that we as artists were continuously trying to reconcile like the, the values that motivate our artistic making with the, institutional I- ideologies that are sort of imposed upon us mm-hmm. and i think i think 
taking time to do things is is one that is really hard. It's like really hard to to really sit with that and and believe it. And um, so, I mean, it's it's been both, of course, right? Like I said, like mm-hmm. I think the reminder that I can take time and I can take more time. And that doesn't necessarily, that doesn't at all delegitimize the value of my work. Um, yeah. And then also, of course, to acknowledge, you know, that, oof, I don't know. Sometimes creativity and incubation, there are, there, there are those moments where it, um, you know, things ripe, right? Like fruits ripe at a certain timeline, at, on a certain timeline, like things, yeah. things fall off the, the, the vine at a certain t- moment. And, and in that, in, in that regard, like, I think also knowing like, and trying to honor that I've been working on a thing and it needs to go somewhere. And I think, you know, we can talk about that later, but as it relates to my other little morsel project, but I think yeah. I've also had to kind of recognize that aspect as well. Yeah. Yeah, I can really relate to that as well, Angel, the understanding that how we were working and maybe even valuing our own work as creatives, as performing artists, was so much about these externally based, you know, these ascribed metrics, right? Mm -hmm. These you know, basically the mindset of you're only as good as your last production. And, you know, it was about produce, produce, produce and grind culture. And, you know, that was wearing us down pre pandemic. Um, And yeah, as you said, like having the permission, giving ourselves permission in this moment, I think too, as people of color, as BIPOC and intersectionally marginalized creatives, that was definitely a a driver of the pace of the work in in my communities, um, mm-hmm. you know, and as you said, giving ourselves permission to understand that even though we are, you know, still creating and still have that drive that the pace has to slow down for our own good as individuals, but also really in this reckoning of of health, spiritually, psychically, emotionally, economically, like just in so many ways that we are mandated to slow down. And so being more deliberate, I mean, the work that you do and you know that I've been privileged to see which also brings me to another point that your last studio visit um the the studio performance rather through your CDF lab artist mm-hmm. um it it was the bookmark it, it really was the last uh event that I attended before lockdown happened and so For real now that we're here a year later literally just over a year later from that performance in March of 2020 mm-hmm. it is just amazing to to really recognize and 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 mark this this past year with the slow down <laughs> you know the the difference what a difference a day makes but what a difference a year makes for sure mm-hmm. and i want to go back um in that early of early year of um not the early year i'm sorry we're gonna have to edit that part out i'm getting tongue-tied here but um going back to the early part of 2020 mm-hmm. when you first began was that when your space soham dance space opened i can't remember the exact date but i think it was early 2020 is that is that right yeah well so soham dance space as an organization started back in 2007 and then it was also it had a living physical studio space in um in Ukrainian village from 2009 all the way through 2017 and then okay. I so there so we we lived and operated in a studio for that long time and then I was abroad um in Berlin for a couple of years and when I came back we were able to make a way to move into a studio in Pilsen um 
at the end of 2019. So that was like October, November, 2019. Okay. We transitioned into that space. So, but yeah, I mean, you know, we were like leaning into 2020 kind of hoping, you know, having, having different hopes for right. what that, what kind of energy would fill that space. And um, yeah, things unfolded differently. The, one of the events that you did have in the new Pilsen space at Soham was a, culminating showcase of your students there, right? Can can you talk a bit about that experience? Because that was happening right at the, mm-hmm. you know, if it was not at the beginning of the pen uh, of the beginning of the uh, lockdown, rather. Um, can you talk a bit about that experience, about how technology and pivoting and that agility of your business model and your platform and your studio. Can you talk a bit about that experience? Yeah. Yeah. So it was last summer that I produced a, an Arangate drum for two of my high school students. And an Arangate drum is kind of a culminating event um, after several years of training that students go through when they're trained in the form of Bharatanatyam. Um, and so this art engagement performance is, you know, it's something that people look forward to for a long time and, and it requires a lot of intense work. And I was working with these two high schoolers who are going to do a duet performance, like an evening length performance, um, you know, 2019, 2020. And we were gearing up for this performance in the summer. And of, of course, it was a big setback uh, to figure out what to do. I mean, they were going to be doing this in a, in a, you know, in a, traditional theater setting um, mm-hmm. so that they could have a full audience of friends and family and the Soham community could attend. So we ended up pivoting to a live stream model. I mean, I think a lot of people, of course, naturally had it to, na- like a lot of people had to naturally cancel these kinds of events, you know, cause they're also, you work with live musicians and that's a really big part of it because a lot of mm-hmm. a lot of the choreography and the composition is really intertwined with like sp- spontaneous expression and so mm-hmm. it's not the kind of thing that you can do to pre-recorded music so that was a big another big piece of the puzzle yeah. that we had to that we struggled with but we we decided to do a performance the students did a performance inside of our dance studio um, we like sort of dressed it up a little bit and created a bit of a backdrop and we decided to do a live stream and it still ended up requiring that I had to go a completely different model with music and get a lot of music pre-recorded. And again, that's really challenging for this kind of repertoire, mm-hmm. um, working remotely with musicians. But at the end of the day, we we did something that I would have never, ever ventured out to do. Like I... I've just never really been interested in seeing dance through a screen. Um, it's never appealed to me. And yet here we were trying to make the most of a situation um, and did this intensive learning with these two students and live streamed it from the studio so their friends and family could still see uh, and and try to, you know, channel the energy of um, all the people at home in a space. And I think that that was yeah, you know, a, an exercise in in our imaginations and in in feeling connected when we're disconnected. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, the students did beautifully and really made the most of it and had a really great attitude about um, you know having to adapt to a new circumstance. I want to also talk about since we're d- discussing the evolution of Soham and mm. uh, the evolution of how your social advocacy ties into the growth and the realigning, you know, pivoting of of the the dance space. Can mm-hmm. you uh, talk to us a bit about another project and platform really that you've been integral in building from the Soham dance space? And that is the Chicago Artist Fund. Um, the way that your social advocacy really has shown up in mutual aid has been a real wonder to to witness angel so if you could Mm -hmm. please talk with us about the chicago artist fund 
Yeah, for sure. Um, it's called the Chicago Artist Relief Fund. And I think as we're all aware, like, you know, shortly last, shortly after the pandemic hit um, last March, the Chicago Artist Relief Fund sort of propped up and I discovered them and their work and was kind of just, you know, moved to help out um, because of how much I, I value the work that us artists do and because of how intimately aware I am of how we get paid and how we make um, make a living and and you know how we survive and thrive and it just felt like um, a very necessary thing to attend to and I think I would say that like my motivation also really came from what has been recently this just like this preoccupation with ecosystems. And like, mm -hmm. you know, what is the ecosystem in which artists move and thrive and make and exist? And like, are we, are we tending to that ecosystem? You know, and are we, are we building it in the way that we, we value? Are we, you know, nurturing it in the way it needs? Um, and this is, I mean, this has just been something that I've been preoccupied with a lot as, you know, in my own artistic journey. And I always think about how I'm moving through ecosystems and, I think in, in the moment of the pandemic, um, it just, it felt like a, a prime opportunity for myself to get involved. But very quickly, I realized that like, uh, I mean, the Chicago Artist Relief Fund needed a fiscal sponsor. And so Hum Dance Space, which has been a 501c3 nonprofit, um, was in a unique position because I had just moved back from Berlin about a year before. And it it was sort of one of these dynamic and flexible moments where it's like, okay, we're a 501c3 organization. What does that mean? And like, how can that lend support to like, how can that be, a, how can that be a flexible and responsive to the moment? Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, yeah, it, it felt like a really opportune time for Soham to sort of step in, offer um, discover first of all legally and logistically how to become a fiscal sponsor for, fiscal sponsor for such an endeavor, um, but then yeah to also kind of it, it felt it's it how would I say it? it it landed really neatly and nicely into what was this sort of reimagining of so hum dance space as something that thinks even more broadly from what it used to be thinking about and. Um, focused on. And yeah, I feel like personally, I, um, it's really hard for me to be interested in my own artwork and my own making if I am not equally invested in the practices of all sorts of different artists around me. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that imagination and that awareness um, has really been what has been fueling a lot of my work recently. Um, and I think, you know, one of the expressions has been the Chicago Artists really Fund and being able to step in as a fiscal sponsor and, and support that cause, which is otherwise run by a group of volunteers. Um, yeah. That is amazing. It's to hear your testimony in in the organic alignment, as you were saying, of the the vision and mission of Soham and the the neat alignment, how the organic ordained even, you know, the timing of the opportunity and you know, your social advocacy, the way it shows up organically within your platform, as you said, the collaborative, uh, collective community aspect of your work, not just for audiences and, and audience engagement for your, your practice and your projects, but Again, it's it's part of your vision of your mission. It sounds like your personal mission to provide platforms in community, whether it is your students, whether it is your collaborators. Um, it's just a wonderful again, a wonderful thing to witness as someone who has seen your works over the years and, and seen the work that you're doing not just on stage, but behind the scenes and really working to build 
an infrastructure, not just a platform, but an infrastructure taking on a role as a fiscal fiscal sponsor in this moment. That's really stepping up to the plate. So I just want to affirm you in that. Thank you. Thanks, Felicia. <laughs> it's been, um, I think it's a, a privilege to be in a position to be responsive, um, to, to be sort of um, you know, to have a 501c3, which, you know, I think there's so much that can be so problematic about the nonprofit industrial complex and just... Yeah, that's going to be a whole other episode. <laughs> I know, we won't, we won't have to go there all the way, but, <laughs> but you know, like the institutionalizing of, of our endeavors is, is, you know, there's, there's pitfalls, but I think, mm -hmm. you know, to, to, it's a privilege to, to be able to be like, well, we have this vehicle and we have an ability to be responsive. And so what can we do? You know, and the Chicago Artist Relief Fund has been a very equity focused fund. And I think that that was also really important um, for the for the alignment. Yes, yes. And the fact that this is once again an artist run platform that we're we're talking about here the mm -hmm. the fiscal sponsorship role that you're now taking on or that Soham is taking on it is testament to the growth and the scaling of an artist run platform so that is once again kudos and gold star for that and especially in this moment i want to transition and talk about how the the different agile moments over the past year of SOHOM and the Chicago Artist Relief Fund. I'm sorry, I was incorrectly stating the, the title of the project, the Chicago Artist Relief Fund. But I want to now talk a bit about your personal practice and a, a personal project, a digital project that was adapted from your live performance project called A Little Morsel. And it was, again, something that I was privileged to experience as one of your invited attendees for the series. And can you tell the folks a bit about the process of both the adaptation and then the execution of A Little Morsel? Totally. Uh, yeah, well, I'm so grateful that you were privy to this like test run I did. Um, so I was working on what I was referring to earlier, this sort of years long project that has had different names. And more recently I was like, okay, this is going to be a show called the next cup of tea. And I realized while for a moment it was like, all right, pandemic, I guess we're going to take a little bit more time with this. Um, I also realized that I couldn't hold the project forever and that there was something mm -hmm. about the project that like just needed to move like it needed to move out of my body and it needed to like mm -hmm. get out into the world and I I just wasn't capable of like shelving it sort of mm -hmm. and yeah I, I had had this idea of doing a sort of accompaniment to the show like in the in the form of these little emails and I was calling them a little morsel um, thinking that like, maybe, you know, I'll send out a, a small little sampling of a, of a handful of emails over some undefined amount of time um, that kind of offer up like little, like a little taste of what are the kinds of questions and impulses that are part of this project. And I think as I got deeper and deeper into the pandemic, what I realized was like, uh, I don't know if I can, if I, if I can keep entertaining this sort of like, the show will come, the show will come kind of attitude. And so basically mm -hmm. I was just like, we're going to just reformat the show into a digital arc of 21 emails um, that was a project I called the little morsel or a little morsel. And, and, you know, I was resistant because I, I wasn't interested in a digital exploration so much, mm -hmm. but because I felt like I also needed a certain amount of closure, I was like, let's do this. Let's try this. Let's, let's work it out. Um, so yeah. So, I mean, it was, it's, it was 21 days. I, I invited 
kind of in, in this first sort of test run, pilot run of it, um, I invited just a small group of people because it was such an experiment. Um, and every day for three weeks, a little email would pop into someone's e- inbox and it, it, you know, it included either like a bit of text, maybe a photograph, maybe a little video, maybe a video of me drawing, maybe a video of me moving, dancing. Um, in terms of like media, it, it, it varied, but it was always attempting to be sort of bite size and small and just a little taste, offering people a little taste of something to chew on. Um, and over the 21 days, it was attempting to also have an arc of its own. Um, so that's, that's kind of what the project was in a nutshell, um, in terms of format. I'm fixating on the format right now. But mm-hmm. um, Can you talk a yeah. bit about the response you received, the feedback? I know that, for instance, part of the A Little Morsel series was the invitation to folks to submit their pics of the drink that they were having as they you know, imbibed with their little morsel, their daily little morsel over the three weeks. And, you know, like just that invitation, like we were talking earlier about the grief of the, you know, losing the visceral element of our live performance practice. But that was definitely something that I personally really, it, 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 it brought back that visceral aspect. It's something that was just really connected. So that feeling of the you had to be in the room type of feeling, the getting the little morsel in the inbox every day, even if you couldn't uh, sequentially, you know, catch up every day at the same time every day when you did, it was a moment to a moment to take in that little morsel. And mm-hmm. it was it was just wonderful. Can you talk a bit about any other feedback from other participants from yeah. from that? Yeah, I mean, I would say that, you know, thanks for sharing your experience. Like, I, I was one thing that was really important to this project was a sense of presence which is why wanting to do it live meant so much to me. But I think that what, you know, what you're referring to is um, the sort of invitation I made as people opened a little morsel each day, there was always a little link to sort of submit a photograph of what you were drinking in that moment. Um, Just, you know, a picture of your glass or your mug or your cup. Um, And I had sort of posted all of those photographs in the same place on a website so that those who were attending these morsels every day could kind of see what, you know, what, who else is drinking what? And, and it was sort of, you know, with the hopes that there would be some, some sense of presence felt, right? Like some sense of like, okay, I'm present with other people. Um, And I'm, you know, I'm present with my drink and I'm present with this morsel. I'm present with this idea. And, you know, it's, it's an attempt, you know, beyond gathering in a live performance space to sort of, uh, activate that feeling. Um, mm-hmm. In terms of feedback, I don't know, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm perhaps still collecting feedback and, and hope mm-hmm. to try this out again. But, you know, I think one person in I had I done I did an anonymous survey, and there were some responses that sort of conveyed that like for some people they kind of felt like they were having a daily chat with me and Mm -hmm. I was like that's cool that's great like that's definitely the vibe that I was hoping for um I think for some people the sort of the the encounter like the encounter that the ways in which people took the morsel and maybe shared it with a person in their life, right? Like a person Mm. they were talking to that day. And then the next day it might've been a different person that they were talking Mm -hmm. to. And then it was a different morsel and how the ways in which it sort of bled into conversations with whoever else was in their, their life at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's like maybe an example of sort of the, like the different kind of intimacy that the project was hoping to and apparently was able to sort of strike, um, you know, in, in terms of just like it, it, I think it seemed like some people at least were able to 
chew on the idea in their personal space in a, in a pandemic moment when we're all separated, but you know, every day you're in conversation with different people and maybe, maybe the morsel kind of fed, fed into that. Oh yeah. Yeah. I definitely can attest to that. It, you know, we've been talking a bit about the, you know, technical aspect and then the the social aspect of of the project. But now I want to dig into a bit more of the actual narrative and content of the project and the sense of intimacy that actually, for me, definitely grew mostly out of the the content of in the narrative of a little morsel. So can you share with us the 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 narrative content and the inspiration. Mm. Mm. Interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the project, the, pro- the project originally sort of started with an attempt to be, to sort of collect and gather and notice what was coming up every day. Like there was an interest in, in, in the daily and the mundane and that like, we have these sort of practices and rituals of like making tea or making a drink or like, you know, washing a cup or placing an object like our toothbrush in a jar, like the things Mm -hmm. that we, like the way in which we have these mundane daily interactions, um, and the way in which that is then sort of juxtaposed or interacts with like everything that's coming up for us in our minds and in our hearts and our thoughts and our feelings. And, mm-hmm. um, and the, the project was really an attempt to like observe that impulse. Like what are these daily impulses, these daily thoughts? And, and, and some of that was like very thematic. Um, and I, you know, and some of it was manifested in just like, in, 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 in an improvisational practice. And so like the arc of this project also aligns with sort of the arc of my, my foray into more improvisational movement. Um, but thematically, it was sort of a, it ended up being a sort of braiding of a few different things, you know? And so there's this like, there's a sort of theme or motif or exploration of, of my grandfather and my relationship with him and also the ways in which a lot of our interactions sort of centered the kinds of ways of living that like capitalism doesn't understand Mm -hmm. like moving slowly or being quiet or um, just sitting still. And then there was this other thread of, of money, of wealth, of class privilege, of, of, the you know in a way the intersections of like my racial identity and my minority identity with what is also a a class privileged identity Mm -hmm. um and kind of unpacking my relationship to that whole predicament (laughs) and all of my mixed feelings um around around that exploration and then and then another thread i would say the last major piece of the braid was was just this exploration around around dance and the politics of art and the the politics of like the forms that i've been trained in and the ways in which um the the it's seen right like the gaze like the the particular kind of gaze that falls upon my body falls upon my my movement practice the ways in which it's understand but it's understood but also the ways in which i am either knowingly or unknowingly perpetuating certain hierarchies and attempting to maybe no longer do so but what like what is that kind of reckoning and wrestling um and oh you know it's just it's asking lots of questions it's not offering lots of answers yeah yeah Um, but yeah that's a that's a little bit of kind of I think what sounds like a jumble and I think that the project was and is trying to hold space for like the jumble of contradictions that is our life, right? Like our life yeah. is just inevitably so contradictory. And so there's always these aspects that are conflicted. And um, 
I think I wanted to take a, take space for sitting with the things that sometimes actually make us quite uncomfortable, but and make us quite confused um, and really trying to excavate a little bit. Yeah, definitely. I I would concur with that 100%. I just had a thought come to me as you were speaking about, you know, having to really sit with these, you know, hold, as you say, holding these, you know, the jumble. But I really like the metaphor that you used about a braid, because that really is what it's like, because it's all of these threads and you can't have, you know, a thread or a braid without each part playing its part, right? And so in this slow down, in the pivoting and the agility and all of the ways that we're having to dynamically navigate this pandemic moment, I feel that the themes that you explore and the vulnerability, uh, that's that's really so stand out about your little morsel project is the vulnerability to make that commitment to say every day for 21 days, I'm going to submit this piece. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's going to be from this place or maybe it's going to be from that place or, you know, but each one, each morsel, it definitely resonated and spoke to me in that angel voice of mm-hmm. critically, critically questioning. And so I really appreciate the fact that there weren't, quote unquote answers provided to to any of these questions, these existential and, you know, ongoing questions that we're all having in this moment, even folks who don't necessarily consider themselves creatives. Mm. We are all grappling with how do we redefine our paths and purpose? What do we keep from our traditions and conventional ways of learning or how we've been trained, right? And how Mm -hmm. do we determine, how do we discern what is still relevant and applicable now to help us forge a future that, that we dream of versus really letting go of what does not serve us, what has been problematic and will continue to be problematic. How do we let go of that just, you know, out of necessity, but also out of the willingness to make a different way to have that radically different future that people, you know, like to talk a lot about, but I don't see (laughs) a lot of people making the work toward it. So, yes. Yeah, just something I want to once again affirm the work that you're doing, that I see you doing, that your communities see you doing. Um, I guess to finish off this awesome conversation, because of course we will have more conversations, you and I one-on-one, but to, to finish off this conversation, is there a vision or a goal i know it's really hard to you know think about i mean planning right now scheduling is mm-hmm. like the bane of so many folks existence especially in this dynamic pandemic era but is there a particular vision or mission that you have for your practice or for so hum dance space um i'm thinking about your resident artists that you now have at so hum can you talk a bit yeah. about that program and how things are going yeah i would love to yeah oh I <laughs> I really appreciate your, you know, your last uh, reflection just about thinking about new ways of doing things and how sometimes maybe people talk about it, but they don't actually do it. And, and I don't know what it is, like it, doing it, doing a new thing is like, I don't know what that is, but I, I you know, I'll, I'll admit, like, I think there's a lot of insecurity and hesitation in trying to, um, you know, like, be be an artist, be an administrator, connect the dots between different visions. Um mm-hmm. and and I I think um yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to learning a lot from this year ahead. But I think to your to your question about like 
these two uh, other up, um, upcoming programs. Um, yeah, I'm really excited about them. So Soham is launching these two pilot programs um, and they're both really coming out of this desire for deeper and more nuanced relationships between either you know the artist and the presenter or the artist and the producer. And, mm-hmm. and you know, it's kind of a, a two-pronged, visioning right now you know we we have one pilot program that is looking to reframe south asian dance and um our inaugural artist is parijat desai from new york city who has been working um you know as a south asian dance artist for so many years and and my attempt as having her as an artist in residence and kind of co-producing some of her programs is the hope is, you know, the hope is that we can complicate the conversations we're having and Mm -hmm. disrupt paradigms that, you know, South Asian dance tends to fall into to resist the tokenization and to have more uh, just, yeah, nuanced and interesting conversations. Um, And then the second pilot program is, is this, this, program to sort of be a producing partner for black dance artists in Chicago. And um, this is really important to me because, you know, South Asian Americans have a very particular position um, in American society, which is a whole another story that we can talk about when we have lots more time. But, you know, I feel like the through the lens of sort of solidarity and equity and reparations and interconnectedness, uh, Soham Dance Space, like we've been we've just felt like it's really important to build on legacies of, of black Desi solidarity. And so we've also launched this other program to sort of support the voices of black dance artists, again, starting with one particular artist, which is Elisa Gregory. And of Elisa. Yes. Uh, yes. What a, hu- what a remarkable human being, Chicago based dance artist who's launching a podcast that also is supporting um, and unpacking and, celebrating the process behind making dance work. Um, and so Soham is on board as a co-producer in that project. And these are two pilot programs that are really exciting and, and meaningful. And also I like to emphasize like, you know, it's like, we're going to learn, we're going to learn and we're going to iterate. And we hope to, um, we don't want to act like we know what we're doing. <laughs> But we want to we want to really, um, you know, I think we're really clear in our intentions and our our aspirations and the kind of support that we can lend and the kind of conversations we can facilitate. And by working with these two amazing artists, Parijat and Elisa, um, I think Soham as an organization can start can start to further sort of stretch its imagination about what role we can play in supporting the ecosystems that we really long to see. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, your question just about like, I think you asked a question about hopes and wishes. And I think like, I'm always interested in connecting dots that are like seemingly disparate, disconnected dots. And mm-hmm. um, I'm, I feel really grateful to be in a position to be working on such distinct di- like distinctly fulfilling projects in their own right, but to be kind of moving, moving, like turning the wheels forward on these kind of few different projects. Um, I'm just really excited about what comes of that, you know, that juxtaposition or, or, or what comes from all of those things kind of living inside of 2021. Um, and, you know, the insights that, that come from that, you know? Yes. Because one, the one thing I've learned, I'd say, is that, you know, an artist is an artist in so many ways, right? It's not like, we're we're makers and creators and philosophizers and like you know social change makers and disruptors in so many different ways and That's right. um yeah i don't know i'm just trying to hold space for that complexity which is sometimes overwhelming <laughs> but um yeah i'm i'm curious so i'm so share. i'm so on board with everything you're sharing about your process. And again, congratulations on launching those residency projects and those 
two fantastic artists. I had the pleasure of actually meeting Parijat in a Zoom room when you had one of your um, Soham events um, announcing your um your business plan, business model. Um, that was something else that I really want to comment and and I'll I'll close this with my final comment is that the mm -hmm. transparency, so not only the agility and the critical thought, but the transparency of your process, the fact that you had the the launch and the announcement of the residencies in tandem with sharing with us the the Venn diagrams of how you're approaching the different priorities of SOHOM and just how very just transparent and reasonable and feasible and action oriented it was. I just, again, kudos to you for building the infrastructure and realizing that it has to be iterative, mm -hmm. you know, like, especially in this pandemic moment where, like Andre 3000 said, you can plan a pretty picnic, but you can't predict the weather. So mm -hmm. that is really true now. But Angela, I appreciate you. I affirm you. And thank you so much for being my first guest on the PRJ podcast. Aw, Felicia, thank you. You are such an inspiring human being. And I have been very honored to be witness to and privy to like all the developments in your life as well in your artistic journey. And so Aww. what what a gift to be in conversation with you today. And there you have it. I'm your host, Felicia Holman. This podcast was produced in Chicago at Tightrope Recording, remotely on Zoom. Original music produced by Jared Brown. Thanks so much for listening and tune in for the next episode where we talk with another leader of Chicago's experimental and expansive performing arts scene. Take care.